Um, and then there's just a little bit of um, housekeeping that we have to do. Welcome to session uh, 2D, Introduction to Art GIS Online at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. My name is Cynthia Henry, and I am the College of Human Sciences Librarian at Texas Tech University, and I'm a member of the TCDL Planning Committee. I'm pleased to be your session moderator today. Um, a little bit of housekeeping we have to do is uh, Texas Digital Libraries and the TCDL Planning Committee are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. And I have just uh, dropped in the chat our code of conduct policy. So if you would like to pull that up, there's a link there that you can read more about that. The session will run until just about 4.30. Please feel free to take breaks as you need to. And I invite you to drop any questions in the chat and I will try to help those uh, questions be answered at the end at our Q&A. We have three speakers this afternoon. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers who are Michael Chinsky, who is the GIS and Geospatial Data Coordinator at the University of Texas at Austin. Sylvia Jones, who is our Science and Engineering Librarian at uh, S Southern Methodist University. And then Kate McNally Carter, who is a research and instruction library, librarian at the University of Houston, Clear Lake. Okay, Kate. Okay, I think, yeah, Michael, did you wanna uh, get, get us started? Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> hi, welcome everyone uh, to our introduction to ArcGIS Online workshop. Uh, I am Michael Shensky, and uh, I think we can go to the, the next slide. Is that right? We're going to start off with the uh, introduction here um, to the TDLGS interest group. So the TDLGS interest group uh, has been around for a few years now. We formed in 2020. And so uh, the three of us today are leading uh, this workshop on behalf of the TDLGS interest group. And we thought this was a, a great opportunity to um, you know, share a little bit of uh, our knowledge of ArcGIS online with everyone here at TCDL who's interested in learning a little bit more about GIS. GIS, um, geographic information systems, and ArcGIS Online specifically. So we're, we're really glad to be here today. And uh, hopefully, if you're interested in the material that we're covering um, and, and find um, you know, uh, this workshop about ArcGIS Online useful, um, you know, we, we'd love to encourage you to sign up for our uh, TDLGS interest group mailing list, um, which you can access at the link right there. And we'll post a link to that um, in the chat in just a second. And, um, oh, and it's already there. And, uh, you know, we, we'd love to see you at uh, some of our upcoming meetings. We, we meet uh, once a month um, and um, you know, uh, it's open to anyone who's, who's interested in attending. So I just wanted to, to say that before we get started and I uh, hope you enjoy the workshop. Thanks. Yeah, and we'll have more um, information at the end of the workshop as well. Um, so, so if you're interested in, and you have any questions about the GIS interest group, uh, feel free to ask those. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we have a pretty full agenda, so um, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to start by kind of giving a brief overview of GIS, um, and then Michael will take over and talk about our GIS online specifically, and then uh, Sylvia will be leading the demo today. So we're going to get started. So um, I think most of you are probably already aware that GIS, it stands for Geographic Information System. Now, I think it does help us to break down those uh, different words and look at their individual meaning and their context and, and with each other um, to kind of come to a, a full definition. So geographic, of course, means that it's information related to earth. Sometimes we also use the word spatial or geospatial. Um, and so geospatial can be a broader term that can be that can refer to space beyond the earth. Um, but you know, a lot of times we use um, those words interchangeably. Um, and then we have, of course, information, which is referring to the data and their meaning. And system or systems, which refers to the collection of computer technology procedures and structures. So bringing all of these together gives us this definition of GIS, which is a framework or a computerized system that can be used for gathering, managing, and analyzing data related to geographical information. So GIS connects data to a map and integrate, integrates location data with other types of descriptive data and then we can visualize that data and interpret it and use that to enhance our geospatial understanding and help us make decisions. 
So what is geospatial uh, GIS used for? So it has a variety of uses and applications in many different fields and, and areas of study. So mapping where things are can help us examine the spatial location of different features to identify relationships and patterns. So this is also sometimes referred to as spatial analytics. So for example, a, recently, a really recent application that I think many of us have seen and used um, is the mapping of the coronavirus cases around the globe. So spatial anal analytics allow us to move beyond just the visual of the data and apply spatial analysis to identify trends and relationships uh, in that data. We can also use forecasting to identify trends and assess risk. So for example, on the top right, we have a map of Norfolk, Virginia. So GIS was used here to identify areas of vulnerability for flooding as sea levels are projected to rise in the coming decades. Um, so this information allows us to better plan for uh, those flooding events to help minimize risk uh, for urban planning. Um, and then we can also use uh, perform analysis to identify and understand problems and potential solutions. So on the bottom left here, we have a map of St. Louis, Missouri, which is showing the historical areas of redlining where different neighborhoods were graded according to their perceived uh, quote unquote residential security, which was a form of institutionalized racism that segregated different populations um, by race and then disproportionately blocked black Americans from adequate housing and wealth. And so GIS was used in this case to look at those historically graded areas and correlate them with different heat islands where the temperature was relatively warmer in those areas that were graded uh, C and D and which were disproportionately occupied by black Americans. And so those warmer areas, of course, are associated with higher levels of pollution and um, result in negative health outcomes like uh, chronic respiratory symptoms and so on. So, so using an uh, GIS to map this out really uh, shows this disparity in a really clear um, and, and visually striking way and also allows us to think towards solutions of how we can address these problems which um, still exist today. So um, in terms of components of GIS, so a GIS is made up of five basic components that contribute to the overall system. So we have the hardware that refers to <clears throat> the computers, the servers, and then also other devices like smartphones that are used to create and share and use data. We have the software and that refers to the applications that provide the functionality to store, analyze and display geographic data. And then of course the data itself. So that includes location information that can be in, in the form of addresses, latitude and longitudinal data, postal codes and so on. So the GIS can manage and integrate data from multiple sources and in order to perform that visualization and analysis. And then of course, people, a GIS needs someone to manage the system and develop plans to apply GIS and solve real problems. So, and then what, finally we have workflows and sometimes this is also called approaches. So these are procedures for analyzing data. So these can improve efficiency, especially for businesses where GIS is used for a specific process or a repeated task. So um, next we have um, geospatial data. So in GIS, there are two basic data models. So vector data is the first data model, which is basically used to capture discrete data in the form of points, lines, and polygons. Um, and polygons are also referred to as area. So this starts from a basic understanding of X and Y coordinates where we can capture simple features as a single point. Uh, so points are associated with just a single pair of uh, coordinates and they have no area associated with them. And so this can be some, uh, simple features like trees, light poles, fire hydrants, uh, things like that. And then we have linear features that can be captured. Um, these can be things like uh, roads, pipelines, um, rivers, so these can be captured as a series of points that are connected by a line. And typically these are used to represent the long narrow features that have length, but not necessarily width. 
Um, more complex features like buildings and county lines and lakes, uh, those can be captured as a series of points that are connected by a closed line segment. So that's what forms the polygon. So polygons are two dimensional and have area. So that's the first um, data model. Um, the second one is raster data. So raster data in this data model, um, data are stored and viewed as a grid of cells where each cell has a value that represents that feature being observed. So if a point falls within a cell, then that entire cell becomes associated with that feature. So similar to, um, so, so similar to vector data, we have points represented here as well as lines and also um, area associated with the enclosed po polygon. So vectors are useful for capturing discrete data sets, whereas raster data can capture continuous data sets where uh, we have more ambiguous boundaries. So vector data also um, can uh, store multiple attributes of, of a feature, and um, whereas raster data can only capture one data, um, data feature. So in layers and GIS data types, um, a GIS basically combines multiple layers of data so that we can visualize it on a map and then perform analysis. So this image here from Esri uh, kind of shows you how those layers come together. So the top three layers represent vector data. So these are those discrete data points, um, lines and four polygons that represent different features from that map or the area of interest on that map. So for example, the first data feature can represent things like boundary lines or county lines. Um, the second layer could be uh, streets. And then the third could be something like building units. Uh, the next two layers underneath that represent raster data. Uh, so these are data that are measured in intervals rather than discrete or hard boundaries. So these layers can represent things like land usage or elevation. Uh, soil pH, so different things that are measured in intervals where um, and not discrete units. Um, and then the bottom layer, of course, is the real world, but basically what the data is trying to represent. So, and then on the right, we have some different um, data types that can be incorporated in a GIS. So the first four uh, represent vector data. So um, we have um, addresses on a spreadsheet, and um, then we also have points, lines, and polygons. Um, then the bottom three represent raster data. So these can be things like scam to map images, aerial imagery, and then lighter data. So um, real quickly, um, before I wrap up um, and hand it over to Michael, I just want to briefly um, talk a, a little bit about um, GIS software and applications. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, applications that can be used, um, and GIS can be used for a lot of different types of geospatial data management tasks. So GIS can be used to store geospatial data, convert it from uh, different data formats, and then it can also be used for processing of geospatial data and analysis and visualization, and then, of course, uh, dissemination, which is a really important important part of GIS is sharing your results. And so depending on what application you're using, there are going to be different capabilities for uh, sharing and then um, doing all these different tasks. So along these lines, I just want to briefly touch on some commonly used GIS applications before turning it over to Michael. So uh, QGIS is a free open source version um, of option that is very commonly used around the world. Um, and also in academic capacities. So one of the great features of it is that it is extensible with plugins and that can be um, helpful to perform additional tasks um, like georeferencing and geocoding. Um, it's also pretty widely accessible because of its open source format and also the availability on multiple platforms. Um, so ArcGIS Pro um, and, and ArcGIS Online in contrast are developed by Esri, so they are not open source, um, but they are widely considered the industry standard for GIS software, and um, they're typically used in a lot of corporate and government um, entities. So they are expensive to purchase, 
Um, ArcGIS Pro is the desktop version of the software, and this integrates with ArcGIS Online, um, which is the cloud-based or the browser-based version of the, of the software. So an ArcGIS Online is particularly useful for its capacity to uh, uh, facilitate collaboration and uh, facilitate sharing of mapping projects, which is um, also a really nice feature of it. And it's also very user-friendly. Um, it's a user-friendly platform, especially for beginning users of GIS. So that was why it was um, chosen as the topic for this workshop today, since it is um, so approachable and easy to pick up. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael to talk about RTS Online. All right, thank you, Kate, for that great introduction to GIS. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now, and we will pick back up with our slides, and we'll start off by um, diving a little bit deeper into RTS Online. So let me put that in slideshow mode. So I'm um, going to talk a little bit more about ArcGIS Online here um, and uh, get us ready for a, a demo of ArcGIS Online that, that Sylvia will be leading us through um, in a little bit. But first, I want to give some background and context um, describing uh, you know, why ArcGIS Online is something that's useful for us to gain some experience with and also talking about um, you know, some of the, the things that we can do with ArcGIS Line, some of the things that we need to consider as we maybe get started with this platform, um, you know, things that, that we should be aware of so that we know how to create our accounts and, and make full use of them. So ArcGIS Online is the, the leading cloud GIS platform. It's very popular. It's, it's widely used both in academia and in industry. Um, it's accessed via a web interface at uh, ArcGIS.com, so it's really easy to reach and, and remember if, if you're using other ArcGIS software and you're trying to remember where to go to log into ArcGIS Online, just ArcGIS.com. Uh, it has excellent integration with Esri's ArcGIS Pro software, so if you are uh, already using ArcGIS Pro, you'll be able to benefit from that integration and easily publish um, your, your web maps or your, your data sets to ArcGIS Online. Um, and if you maybe you know you're, you're just getting started with GIS um, right now, and, and maybe the first thing you're exploring is ArcGIS Online, you can always uh, dive a little bit deeper and pick up ArcGIS Pro at a later point and be able to integrate easily with uh, the things that you've already developed uh, in ArcGIS Online. So you can, for instance, view the materials and um, assets that you have uploaded to ArcGIS Online within the ArcGIS Pro environment. But if you're also interested in using QGIS for any reason, like let's say you're, you're using a Mac, um, which you can install QGIS software on, but it's a little more difficult to install ArcGIS software on because it requires Windows, um, you, you can still uh, kind of mix and match and use ArcGIS online while also continuing to use QGIS. You just need to, to separately upload your data through the browser. You can't easily interact um, with ArcGIS online through QGIS. And, uh, there, there is some limited ability to do that, but it's not nearly as uh, advanced as what you'd see if you're using um, a software product like ArcGIS Pro. So when we're getting started with ArcGIS Online, like we are today, uh, we're not assuming anybody has any previous experience or anything like that. Um, there is no need to install software to use ArcGIS Online. So although there, there is an integration with um, software like ArcGIS Pro, uh, it's not required. You can uh, be using ArcGIS Online and, and taking advantage of much of the functionality it offers without ever having to actually install anything on your computer. You just need to create an ArcGIS Online account and log in, and then you can start uploading data, um, building web maps, and doing some other things that we'll be talking about uh, today. So what is ArcGIS Online used for? It's used uh, for a variety of different things, primarily, though, um, storing geospatial data in the cloud. So you can make backups. You can upload data that you can share with other people if you want them to be able to view your data, data sets or even edit your geospatial data sets. Um, that's done by publishing geospatial data services. So once you publish a geospatial data service, um, it's possible to consume that in a web map. So other, if you're, if you're sharing it with others, they can pull it into to their web maps. You can pull it into web maps that you're creating. Um, if you have uh, a, a account that's linked to an institution um, and, and you have access to ArcGIS Online credits, then that would give you the ability to publish um, data sets that you can even load into um, 
uh, the ArcGIS collector mobile application. So you could go out and collect data on your phone and be editing information and collecting data points that then sync to the cloud and get stored in ArcGIS Online. So that's that's a really cool thing to be able to um, uh, utilize ArcGIS Online for as well. Uh, you can create and host interactive web maps that are really easy to customize and share. You don't need to know web design. You don't need to um, you know, purchase separate hosting. Everything is done through the ArcGIS online platform, which makes it really easy to get started with creating um, interactive maps that you want to share online. Uh, and you can even develop things that are that are more complex than just a, an interactive map. You can, for instance, develop story maps to tell really detailed geospatial stories. So with story maps, you can embed uh, different types of media, images, audio, video, text. Um, in addition to interactive maps and static maps that you might develop using GIS software. So it's a really powerful platform. And again, you know, one of the reasons why we're focusing on it today, it's a great entry point for many folks uh, who are starting to explore GIS. And there's a variety of reasons why uh, ArcGIS Online is, is so popular. Um, it, it just, again, you know, it's, it's become the uh, leading cloud GIS platform because it's really easy to, to work with your, your data and your interactive maps. Um, it has that nice integration with other ArcGIS software. You don't need to worry about web hosting or anything like that. And it's a great way to, to back up your data um, uh, and, and make sure it's kept safe and not just on your um, individual machine. So um, I also want to talk quickly here about ArcGIS Online account types. Uh, some of you may already have ArcGIS Online accounts that are linked to your um, academic institution. If you do have that, that's great. That's going to give you some additional capabilities. Um, but it's also possible to create a free ArcGIS Online account uh, to get started. So there are a few things uh, to be aware of uh, if you are at that stage where you're just starting to use ArcGIS Online. Um, a free account is going to be missing some of the functionality. So for instance, if you're trying to build a, a web app, a, a more sophisticated interactive web map, you might not have the ability to add certain types of tools or widgets to your map. You can see here in the center of this slide, uh, on the left, we see the options that are available to you when you're creating new types of objects in ArcGIS Online. If you have a free account, it's a little bit limited, map, scene, app, and templates. Um, and you have additional options if you are uh, working with an institutional uh, ArcGIS Online account. And so you, you also see a sad face down there in the bottom right showing things that you might not have access to if you're just using a free account. Um, so it, it's a definitely a good thing to explore creating an institutional account if you have the ability to do that. that and I'll, I'll talk about that on the next slide as well. Um, many academic institutions have site licenses to Esri's ArcGIS software, including to ArcGIS Online. So it's likely that you, you probably have access to it through your institution. Um, if you do, uh, there, there might be a few different ways that your accounts can be managed um, at an organizational level, and that will affect how you'll sign in to your account. Um, and you, you also want to think carefully about that, that process of creating an institutionally linked account because once you create it, it is tied to your institution. So if you leave that institution for any reason, uh, you retire, you accept a job elsewhere, if you're a student and you graduate and you leave that institution, um, you will lose access to your account at some point after uh, that affiliation ends. So um, one of the things that uh, an institution can set up is called single sign-on integration, which means that um, you know, most academic institutions are going to have a single sign-on system that allows you to use the same set of credentials to uh, sign into different portions of your uh, university website. So maybe you're accessing library services, you're logging into your email, um, you're logging in to register for courses or to, to make payments. Um, all the or logging into your HR systems, you know, all of those things are, are usually done with a single set of credentials. And you can connect ArcGIS Online to your institutional single sign-in system, or at least your, your administrator uh, for your organization uh, would do that uh, to set up ArcGIS Online fully. And if you do have that in place at your institution, all you'll need to know is the uh, ArcGIS organization URL. So in uh, our case, we see here in the um, uh, second screenshot from the left, it says UT-Austin there in the center. Uh, and that's because that is the organizational URL for uh, University of Texas at Austin, it's UT-Austin. So if you're at a different university, you would just need to know what that um, string of text is that uh, your university is using. Once you type that in and click continue, it will take you to a page where you confirm that it you know, you've successfully entered in your university's uh, unique URL. So in this case, uh, there under enterprise login, we see a blue button that says University of Texas at Austin. That confirms that I did type in uh, the right URL. So I click that blue button 
And then at that point, oops, uh, it would direct me to our UT Austin single sign-in um, page where uh, this is the same uh, page I'd be presented with if I wanted to log in to check my email or um, check out a library book or something like that. And so uh, you would just enter your regular credentials there and then you would uh, be logged into your ArcGIS Online account. And even if you didn't have an existing ArcGIS Online account, this would create one automatically for you. The first time you log in, your account gets created. So uh, many institutions do have this configured. Um, it's, it's really easy if you do have this set up uh, at your university and you happen to know what that uh, organizational URL is for your institution, you can go ahead and do that. Um, if you don't have that set up and you're interested in, in trying to follow along with the demo today, then I would encourage you to set up a free account uh, for ArcGIS Lens. If you go to ArcGIS.com, uh, you can sign up there and, and create a free account. So some things to know about uh, ArcGIS Online accounts. Even if you are um, uh, using an account that's linked to your institution, uh, there are limits on what you can do with ArcGIS Online. So New user accounts are typically assigned a limited number of service credits. So this controls basically uh, how many uh, different types of things you can do, uh, how much uh, of the ArcGIS Online resources you can utilize before your account kind of gets locked uh, until you are assigned additional credits. Uh, so doing things like carrying out analysis, um, uh, using proprietary data sets, uh, storing large data sets in ArcGIS Online, all of those things will consume credits. So let's say you create a new account, you're assigned 500 credits. If you are doing a lot of analysis in ArcGIS Online, maybe over the span of a month or two, you use up all of those credits, you would have to contact your administrator to request more. And each organization is assigned a, a limited number of credits overall each year. And so uh, that's why those limits are in place is to prevent any one person from using up the entire university allocation. Um, another thing to know, and I've already mentioned this, uh, is that once your uh, institutional affiliation ends, your account will be deactivated. So you want to make sure that if you know that is something that is approaching for you, you know you're going to be leaving soon. You'll want to make sure you back up your data, um, either download it or transfer it uh, to another account within your organization to ensure it's preserved. Uh, ArcGIS Online Assistant can be used to help you transfer uh, content uh, between accounts, so that can be helpful. Uh, and an administrator for your organization can also move um, assets from your account to another account within the organization if you'd like them to do that. And uh, again, you, you just want to think carefully about preserving any content that you create to make sure it's not lost. Uh, so once you are logged into the ArcGIS Online uh, platform, you'll see a, a navigation bar. Uh, at the top and so that's what we see a screenshot of here down at the bottom so you have a, a few different things that you can go to gallery map scene notebook groups content and organization so i'm going to quickly um, uh, summarize uh, the, the key things to know here when you are um, uh, you know, using the, the arcgis online um, interface so again you want to be thinking carefully about your arcgis online credits and and how the things you're doing within arcgis online will consume those credits so over here is a, a table that you can uh, pull up online if you search ArcGIS Online Service Credits. Um, it will tell you how many credits are utilized by certain operations. So if you're geocoding and you're trying to find coordinates for uh, address um, uh, records that you have, that would, for instance, consume credits. So for each um, 40 or for each thousand addresses that you um, generate coordinates for, you'll use 40 credits. So if you are assigned uh, 400 credits when you create it, your account, then that means that you could geocode 10,000 addresses before you run out. Um, and you also want to think about um, uh, potential limitations that you have on what you can do with ArcGIS Online um, that, that maybe your administrator has control over. So when your account is initially created, you'll be assigned a default role. And that default role maybe doesn't necessarily have access to everything that, that you could possibly do within ArcGIS Online. So if you find that you are not able to access the notebooks functionality or geocoding functionality, or you can't create a shared update group that allows you to collaborate with others and, and edit the same uh, uh, web maps or data sets within ArcGIS Online, you might want to contact your administrator to request that you be given additional privileges. So something um, that as you get more confident in the ArcGIS environment, if you recognize that there's something you're not able to do, um, it never hurts to reach out to your administrator and ask if, if that can be assigned to your account. 
Now, once you uh, get logged in, you have your account set up. Again, you know, it's good to be aware of, of these limitations and what to do if there's additional functionality you're interested in. Um, you can start exploring the functionality of the platform. So one of the first things that folks will usually do is create and upload content. Uh, so this shows the, the process for doing that. If you log into the system and you click on the, the content uh, button up at the top, you can then select new items and you can uh, drag things in. So if you have a, you know, files on your computer, like a zip shape file or a zip file to your database, uh, you can uh, drag that in and uh, it will automatically upload it to ArcGIS Online. It will be stored in your account. Um, if you want to uh, publish new things, you can also create a, a new item and create a, a new map. Um, you can um, uh, uh, create and upload many different um, things um, and, and have a variety of different types of content within your um, account. And once you upload things it, it, or create new things within ArcGIS Online, it's not uncommon to want to share those with others that you might be working with, others in your unit or department. Um, or maybe others will want to share things with you. And so uh, that sharing is done with groups. So you can create groups uh, that you can invite others to join and you can join uh, other groups uh, either through invitation or maybe there are open groups that, that you have the, the freedom to join within your uh, ArcGIS Online organization. And so over there on the right, we see the process for creating a new group and some of the, the settings that you have control over. So um, it's always good to, to visit the documentation too, to learn more about um, you know, how to set those things up so you understand all the parameters when you are, for instance, creating a new group. All right, so once you have uh, some content created, um, maybe you've uploaded some data sets, you've created groups, you're interested in sharing new things, um, you know, one of the, the easy things for folks to get started with is creating a new map. Um, so you can create a new map and upload data, for instance, if you have a shape file on your computer, the one you've downloaded from a geo portal online or a shape file maybe you've created yourself. Um, you can upload the a zip version of that shape file to ArcGIS Online and publish it as a data set as well, uh, publish it as a hosted feature layer, and then you can load that into a web map. And so that's what we see here in the top screenshot is a very simple map um, showing points that you can click on and see a pop up that has information about those points. Um, you can turn a web map into something more complex by creating a web mapping application that uses an interactive web map as a foundation and then it allows you to set custom themes um, with different colors and different layouts and to add uh, special widgets and tools that provide additional functionality like the, being the uh, functionality to search uh, or carry out custom searches for features uh, in your map or to filter features in the map and, and there's uh, a wide variety of different widgets that you can add. And you can also create story maps, which I mentioned a, a little while ago, just very quickly. And this allows you to create um, almost like a presentation. Uh, it's a scrollable web page, basically, that allows you to embed different types of media, videos, audio, uh, pictures, text, and interactive maps and static maps. So a wide variety of things to help you tell a story on a particular topic or theme. And all of these are made really easy. Uh, for you to create within the ArcGIS Online environment without having to know any coding or web design. It's kind of just point and click. Um, with your ArcGIS Online hosted layers, uh, this is uh, you know, what we would refer to uh, um, our, our published data as. If you're publishing a data set to ArcGIS Online, um, it gets saved as a, a hosted layer. Um, so this is different than just making a, a copy of the data to ArcGIS Online. If you do make a copy of the data, for instance, if you upload a zip shape file, it will ask you if you want to publish that um, as a, a hosted layer. And that's, that's a, that you can do both things at the same time, but it's not necessarily done by default. So you want to keep in mind there is a distinction there. Um, and uh, if you just upload a layer uh, or upload a, a zip shape file, it's just a copy of the data that lives there that all you can do with it is download it. It's just a backup in ArcGIS Online. If you publish the data to ArcGIS Online, it means it can be loaded into uh, web maps. It can be consumed by others. You can make it editable so that people can add new points or delete points um, if you'd like them to be able to do that. So it's just important to, to recognize that distinction there. Um, and so this is uh, you know, really powerful to be able to publish those data sets online to share them and to allow collaborative editing. 
And there are different types of feature layers to be aware of. Feature layers are used for vector data um, that can be made editable and you can pull up attribute information for your points, lines, or polygons. Uh, scene layers are for 3D data. Tiled layers are for typically for image data that, uh, or vector data that you want to load really fast. If it's really complex information, you're not going to be uh, querying attribute information. And also there are imagery layers um, that you can use to uh, share raster data that uh, allows for accessible attribute information where you can actually pull the information from the pixels in the raster. So here's a little bit more information about web maps. Again, this is the, the simplest type of map that you can create within ArcGIS Online. You do have some customizable options. So you can change, for instance, the, the symbology of the layers in your map to, to choose the colors or the, the shapes or the sizes of uh, features um, for communicating information. And this makes it really easy to um, share information with others and, and disseminate um, your, your data sets uh, through an interactive web map that you can share the URL to uh, with somebody who can view it online. Uh, one other thing I'll point out here is that there is kind of a change going on right now in the ArcGIS Online environment um, where they're switching from the, what's called the classic viewer uh, to the new map viewer. And so uh, you, you might see a distinction there, or if you see screenshots and they, they don't match exactly with what you're seeing in your system, it might be because the screenshots you're looking at are maybe using the classic viewer and maybe you're using the new viewer and you can still switch back and forth between them. Um, it is possible to carry out uh, simple types of analysis in ArcGIS Online. So you can add, delete, and edit data. As I mentioned, you can also join tables together um, to see uh, attribute information um, uh, from two different uh, tables or data sets um, brought into a single table. Uh, so that can be really useful. Uh, data enrichment, if you want to rely on some of Esri's proprietary data, you can access that through ArcGIS Online. Um, spatial interpolation, buffering, uh, you know, there's a list of other things that you can do as well, but uh, some of the more advanced functionality might require you to use a, an installable tool like uh, ArcGIS Pro. Uh, ArcGIS Online Notebooks, if you're um, familiar with Python and you're interested in, in writing Python code that you can save in ArcGIS Online, you can use um, the Notebooks functionality to do that. Uh, these notebooks um, do not use credits by default, but if you want a more powerful notebook, then that would consume credits. So you have the option of selecting what type of notebook you want to create. And this functionality is not necessarily available by default. This might be something that you have to request from your administrator if they have not made it um, available to everybody by default in your organization. Uh, web apps, uh, which I mentioned a little bit already, are basically interactive web maps that provide some additional functionality. So we see that the uh, the widgets that I mentioned a little bit earlier are shown in the bottom right down there. These are the different types of tools that you can add uh, to your web app. And again, these are built on top of a web map that you would have already created. So you already have your data picked out, you have your symbology defined, and this is just choosing the, the theming, the layout of the, the web application and the, the custom tools that you want to add to it. And then there are story maps. So here we see some examples of the types of content that you can add to a story map. So um, different uh, formatted text, so you know, open paragraph of text, bulleted list, numbered list, titles, uh, quotes. You can add images, you can add maps, you can add video, you can um, embed content from elsewhere online, you can add audio. Um, and uh, over on the right, we see some of uh, visual examples of what these things might look like. So pictures and videos. Um, and, and paragraphs of text. And here are some examples of story maps to take a look at. Um, so this is a, a map that was developed uh, by, by Josh Conrad here at the University of Texas at Austin, um, and looking at some of our, our architectural data uh, from our uh, Alexander Architectural Archives. And over here, we have a map that was recently created last semester by um, two faculty members who collaborated with um, there are classes who, who collected data about uh, events that took place in Austin during the civil rights area and, era, and these students were able to, to collect really, um, uh, really amazing media related to these events. So pictures and video and audio recordings of people describing the events and put these together into an interactive map. So I'll share these links um, in the chat in just a second, uh, but I want to make sure to switch over to uh, Sylvia now to, to give her time for the demo. And again, I'll share those links. Uh, thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you very much. Now for the fun part, for the fun part. So let me try to share my screen. Um, let's see. Can you see my screen? Okay. So what we're going to do for this 
part of the workshop is to, these are the learning objectives. We're gonna learn how to do basic navigation of ArcGIS Online and Story Maps. We're gonna create a simple web map in ArcGIS Online, and then we're gonna create a simple story map. I'm not very sure how many of you here have or already have like institutional accounts, but if you don't, you wanna go ahead and create a public ArcGIS online account, open up another web browser and go to ArcGIS.com if you want, please. I'm gonna be doing a demo and I would like you to follow along as you can, okay? For those of you who have institutional accounts, go ahead and log into your school account, and then, um, We'll continue. Okay, so let's see. Oh, let me do my screen, my slides. Sorry. Slides. Okay, well. So for the RGS online demo, what we're gonna do, we're gonna take a look at see how to navigate the software, how to search for and add layers, how to configure pop-ups if we have the time. We're gonna talk a little bit about symbology, how to change the symbols and the colors on your map. We're gonna do some filtering and some simple analysis. That's what we're gonna do in the RGS Online demo. And with the story maps demo, we're gonna start a new story. We're gonna add a title, add a just add some narrative. We're gonna add some media, an express map. We're gonna do some to talk a little bit about the design, how to enable navigation and all that, and then how to publish or share your story that you've created. Okay. So um, let me. Do new share. Let me stop sharing. Let me go into our JS online. Hold on. I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna go into sorry, let me share. Okay, let's see. Okay, go ahead and go to. Can you see my share my screen? Yes. Go ahead and sign in, please. If you already have an object an institutional account go ahead and sign in. But if you don't already have one, we wanna go ahead and create a public account, which you can do almost, well, you can do a lot of things in a public account, but like um, Michael stated, it has some limitations. And one of the biggest limitations is you cannot save the maps that we create. And that's gonna be very important because the map that we create in this part of the workshop, we're gonna use it, we're gonna, um, with the story maps, okay? So go ahead and click on sign in. If you don't already have an account, click on create an account, okay? But if you already have an account, for example, I think there's somebody there from SMU, the SMU institutional account would be SMU Dallas. And continue and SMU. Your page is gonna be a little different from my page, okay? Because I have so many, so much stuff in there, okay? But it would open up to map, let's see. I wanna, do you all, have you all like created an account to sign in? Just let me know by show of hands. I don't wanna to go too fast. I want you all to be able to like um, follow up with me. Okay. So we, Michael mentioned two versions of ArcGIS Online. There's the newer version and there's the, the classic version, okay? There are some things that the classic version can do that the new map viewer cannot do. So for this exercise, we're gonna use the classic map viewer, okay? So go ahead, if you're, if you're in ArcGIS Online and there's a link there that says opening classic view on the top right, go ahead and click on that. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and click on new map. Okay, create a new map. We'll do a very, very simple exercise. Let's take a look at what the screen looks like. Okay. I'm going to point out some important um, navigation tools right here. The add, the add link there is what you use to add content to your map, okay? You can search for a map, you can search for layers, you can add your own layer if you have already, you already have your own data in a file, but that's where you go to add layers to the map. 
the base map, every, every map has a base map, okay? It's a, it's a map that allows, it gives you some context to what the kind of information that you're gonna to add to the map that you're gonna create. The analysis icon there would allow you to do different types of analysis. I'm gonna use some of those. On the right side there at the top, you can save the map. If you have an institutional account, you can save the map, you can share a map, you can print the map. And then this one, this link there for directions would give you directions from different, to different points on the map. Okay, that's if you do the measure, click on measure, it would allow you to find the areas on the map. For example, if you click on, you want to find the area of different parts of the map, you can click on, on this first icon. You can measure the distance from a map on the map, and you can also find out what the latitude and longitude on the map on the map is. Okay, and then the bookmarks icon that would allow you to bookmark a page or a map, place on a map that you can easily go to without having to search for anything. Okay, right here is the search box. We're gonna go in. Okay, and then you're gonna use like, in the middle of the screen right there, the plus and minus signs are what you use to zoom in and out of the map. Okay, and then the little icon in the middle is the home, is the default extent. You can use it to go back to the original, um, extent of the map that was saved, all right? I'm gonna go back to my original extent, okay? And in here is the search box. Let us go in, let's say we're doing an exercise. We wanna look at um, like the ISD campuses. So, so go in there and type in Texas. Let's go type in Texas. And then you wanna do Texas USA. The map is going to go in and zoom in onto the state of Texas. Okay, but there's nothing right here. We want to add some information to the map. The data that we use in our just online, the data in a map is um, expressed as in layers. Okay, it visualizes layers. So how do we add data to the map? Go to this um, button on the left top side. Click on Add. Okay, we want to. You can search for layers or you can add layers from different places. If you had your own data set that you had collected somewhere, you could click on add layer from five, which we're not gonna do, okay? Or you can go online and find different geospatial layers and can add them to your map, but we're not gonna do that. Or you can browse the living atlas, which is the curated set of um, layers or geospatial information that's been curated by um, Esri, but we're not gonna do that either. You're gonna click on search for layers, Okay, our exercise today, go ahead and type in DISD campuses. Okay, if you take a look right here, I have on the screen my content. If I wanted to search information that I had saved into our JSON line, I would go there to click on my content and find data from what I had saved, but I'm not going to do that. Okay. So go ahead and type in the ISD campuses and click on search. Okay, and we wanna scroll down. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't wanna do my content. I wanna do um, just online. DISD campuses, we're gonna scroll down. These are all different layers that different people had saved in our just online. We wanna scroll down and find a layer that's by um, Montmartre, Martinson. Let me see if I can type in the name in the chat. I want to find a layer by Moon. Let me see. Okay, if you can see what I typed in, so we're going to scroll through and find a layer. Let's see. Scroll down. There's one that we want to, the layer that was updated for 18, 19. There's one here by Mark Martinson, but that's not the one we want, okay? Let's scroll down and find this other layer. Okay, this one. It says DISD campuses by Mark Martinson, 19. It was updated 
for 1819, okay? So these are all the layers. So see, to get some inform more information about the layer, you can click on the title of the layer to read about it, okay? So get some basic information, some basic descriptions about it. And if it's something you want, you wanna click on add to map, you're gonna add this layer to the map. Okay. And there on the right side on the map, you see all these little dots, okay? We're gonna go in and add another layer. So go back and um, X out of this DSD campuses or erase that, we're gonna type in Dallas hospitals as well. Okay. So it came back showing off 37 layers. This time we wanna use the very first layer that's by Dallas public underscore Dallas GIS. We're gonna add this also to the map. Use the plus sign to add it to the map. Okay. All right. so right, if you look at the map now, we have two different features. We have the Dallas hospitals and then we have the DSD campuses. Close out. X out and then go back to use the arrow. We're gonna go back, okay? Under you see the link that's to content. So we're gonna take a look at the layers that we have on the map. Click on content, okay? And right here you see the two different layers that we just added to the map. Like we said, data in ArcGIS is visualized as um, layers on a map, okay? So there are some different, icons beneath the titles of different of the different layers okay the first one would be the um the, the index the, the sorry the legend okay the other one is the attributes layer which is where the data that is visualized on the map is is found so if you go ahead and click on this table click on show table under hospitals at the bottom of your screen here, you see all the information that's included in the table, okay? We have the name of the hospitals, the address, the website, etc. So it's all of this information that's visualized on the map, all right? Go ahead and close X out of the um, table, the attribute table. And then you have the third icon, which is change style, which is what you use when you want to work on the symbology. And then you have the other icon, which is the filter. We're gonna use this one. We're gonna use the next one is the cluster points. We're not gonna do anything with it. And then the third icon is the one for to perform analysis. We're gonna work use that later on. Then you have three dots right here, which give you more information, okay? You can zoom to a section on the map. You can change the transparency. You can move a, fill, a layer up and down. You can copy a layer, you can do different things. Okay, using these other options that you have on the, under the, um, the title of the layer, okay? So what we're gonna do right now, we're gonna copy a layer because what the exercise is we want to just filter out, we want to look at just the high schools in the, that, that part of the, um, the DISD school district, okay? So go to DISD campuses again, all right? On the three dots right there, if I'm going too fast, let me know and I'll try to slow down. Okay, click on the three dots and click on copy. Okay, copy. Okay, so we just copied that layer. Okay, right now you should have three different layers that are checked on your, on your map. Okay, we have the DSD campuses, the copy, then we have the hospitals, and then we have the DSD campuses, the original one, okay? So first of all, I need to point something out before we continue working on the layers. Go up here to base map. Let's take a look at the different base maps, okay? Click on base map. Right here, the, the default base map is, is the topographic base map. Go ahead and choose any of the other base maps to see what, what they look like once you change a base map, okay? That one is imagery hybrid, then you have the streets, okay? Then you have dark canvas, whatever, okay? But we're gonna go back to the topographic layer. Like I said, each map has a base map and this base map um, give you a point of, um, allow you to work 
point of reference on the map. Okay, so if you wanted to work with just the topography, you would use a topographic based map. If you wanted to see the streets in this area, you would use the, the street map um, based map. Okay, now let's go back to our layers. Okay, now go ahead. We can turn layers on and off. Go ahead and turn off the DISD campuses layer. Turn it off. Okay. Go ahead and turn off the hospital slayer. Uncheck it. So the symbol for the hospitals is gone, but you still have all of these um, dots that are similar to what we had on the DISD campuses. Okay. So what we want to do right now, we want to filter because this, if you go ahead and click on the, on the show table, the attribute table, okay you have, the, again, the data that's been visualized on the map is from all of this information here. The levels, the T, the school name, all of these different fields are the, the data that's been visualized as those little dots on the map itself. What we wanna do right now, there are 249 features, the middle schools, high schools, charter schools, all of the different types of schools in the DISD, um, school districts, what we want, go ahead and close this out. We only want the high schools, okay? Our exercise is just to show what the high schools that are closest to the hospitals. So go ahead under the desk campuses copy layer, click on the fourth um, icon that says filter, okay? We're gonna filter this information that we have on the map right now. So why it says addresses, we wanna go ahead, we're gonna scroll down and find the level, click on level. We only want this new layer to show only the high schools. So you say level is, go ahead and type in high. Okay, so we tell you we want the system to filter out from this data set you only want to see the high schools go ahead and apply filter and take a look at your map right now okay it only has now it has fewer fewer points than we had before all right so what i want you to do we can rename the filter go ahead and click on the three dots again we're going to rename this filter go ahead and click on rename do DISD campuses instead of copy, do high schools or high. And then put your um, initials right there. And click on OK. All right. So we've changed the name of this particular layer right here. OK, all right. So, um, but if you go ahead and check the DISD campuses layer, the original layer, the symbols are the same. You don't, you cannot see the difference between those two layers, right? So what we wanna do, we wanna change the symbology. We wanna change what the, the um, DISD campuses points look like, okay? So go ahead right there, click on the third icon where it says change style. Okay, and why it says options, go ahead and click on options. Okay, and then there's symbols. We have a little symbol there with the word symbols. Click on that. We're gonna change that symbol to differentiate it from what's on that original DS campuses layer. Okay, where it says shapes, choose any one of the shapes. I'm gonna choose this purple colored one. And then we're gonna increase the size of the symbol so that it's more, it's more visible. So change this 20 to 40. Oops. All right, no, I want 40. Hold on. Why isn't this? It should allow me to type in 40, let's see. Okay, I typed in 40, I'm gonna click on okay. And then if you take a look now at your map itself, the symbols have changed. Go ahead and click on okay. 
done, all right? And then if you uncheck the DIST campuses layer, you'll see now that you have the symbols for the DIST campuses. High school layer is different, all right? So now we're gonna do a simple analysis. Go ahead and check the hospital layer again. We wanna do simple analysis to see what um, high school, what schools are within a one mile zone around the high schools. So go ahead and click on analysis right here at the top. Okay. We're gonna use, Michael mentioned the different types of analysis analysis you can do. This time we're gonna use um, use proximity. We're gonna create buffers. Go ahead and create buffers. Okay. And this time we're gonna choose the layer, the hospitals. Okay. We want a one mile buffer around the hospitals. Okay. And under options, we're gonna go ahead and click on options. We're gonna do overlap, which is fine. And then we're gonna give the new layer a name, buffer of hospitals, and put your initials by it. And then click on one analysis. We're gonna see what it looks like, a one mile buffer area. Oops, okay, it already has my name. Let me do something else, Jones. I'm gonna click on one analysis. So what we wanna do, we just wanna see what it looks like, a one mile buffer around the hospitals. It shouldn't take that long. Oh, I think I know what I did. Okay. Do you all have that? Okay. So let's go ahead and just save this. This is just what we want for this one. Just go ahead and save. Go ahead and click on save as and give it a title. Maybe my first map or whatever. My TDL map. Okay, one, I'm just gonna give it a title. You can give it a, a, a summary, describe it if you want, and it's gonna save into your account. And then click on save map. So we're done with this. We just created a very simple map with showing the locations of the high schools, okay, in the DISD, and then the ones that are located closest to the, um, within a one, one mile buffer zone around the hospitals, okay? Any question about this? I know we have to run very fast. I'm not I'm talking too fast. Any question about this? No? Okay. So now what we're gonna do, okay. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to, oops, let's see. I'm gonna go, go to home. I'm gonna go to home. And right on the right side of my screen, where my name is, there are all these little dots. I'm gonna go ahead and click on the dots. I'm gonna click on story maps. Now we're moving on from the just online session to the story map session. And I'm sorry, it's kind of rushed, but we, we are like limited in time, okay? Um, Michael explained what story maps are. They used to create stories. And this time we're gonna do a very simple map. Click on a new story. Okay, and we're gonna start from scratch. Okay. So what we're gonna do, the exercise for this is, let's say we're supposed to go, we're going to the um, city council, we're gonna talk about the problem with growth in Dallas and how it affects schools and all of that. So we're gonna title the story, what I have done, I have, already typed in my, my narrative, and I'm gonna use that narrative to populate the story, okay? So right here at the top, it tells you that you have a draft. It's already a draft. The design would allow you to go ahead and click on design, which would allow you to do some extra things, change what your cover page looks like, which would allow you to enable navigation and all those things. 
click out, preview or library to preview a map that you've done before you publish it to see what it looks like, and publish would allow you to, once you create the map, to share, to indicate what level you want to share before you can publish it, okay? So let's go ahead and add a cover image or video to my um, cover story. I'm gonna click on add cover image. You can go in and find an image that you have if you've already saved it on a map or you go out into the web and find an image. Let me see, uh, let me find my story. I have this, I'm gonna copy hyperlink. You can upload a file, okay, and add it. Okay, that's my covers, that's my cover page for my map. And then I'm gonna title my story. It's called The Problem with Growth in Dallas. You can type it for whatever reason. Uh, copy. What you want to do, go ahead and type in your title, and then you can start with a short introduction or a subtitle. I'm going to make this a subtitle. Okay. And then you can go ahead and start adding your narrative. If you scroll down to this little circle right here with the plus sign, this is what allows you, this is what you can use to add narrative to your um, story. If you click on the plus sign, this um, block palette is arranged in, but with, organized by functions. What you can use the te different text formats, what you can use to add the multimedia options. And then at the bottom, you have the different types of story maps that you can create, okay? So if I wanna go ahead and start adding my text, I can click on add text. And if I want a new paragraph, I'm going to click on paragraph. I'm going to make a heading. Go in and type. Um, my first paragraph will be the city. Go in and type the city. It's very simple. OK. And then now I want to continue adding my text. Go back to the plus sign. Go to text. And I'm going to add um, a paragraph or any other narrative that I want. Let me go back. Let's see, copy. And paste, okay. So when you wanna keep on adding information or text to your, to your um, story map, you go in, click on the plus sign, you start typing if you want, Okay, but since I already have my own narrative or written out, I'm gonna go just go back and copy and paste. My next paragraph would be um, schools. I'm gonna go in uh, type schools. Okay. Oh come on. My computer is acting very funny right now. Sorry about that. I don't know what. Let me just type scores. Okay. So I'm gonna go in and add my narrative. Should I put any add? Should I just type anything that you want? Okay. I'm gonna go in and add my. Paste. Okay. And let's say I want to add a map because it's a story map, okay? I'm gonna go in, let's say I wanted to add a map right away when I was talking about the city of Dallas. I'm gonna go back to the top, right below where it says the city, I'm gonna click on the plus sign and then click on map. I'm gonna go ahead and find a map of Texas and add it to my map. Let me see if I can find it. Go ahead, copy. Oh, 
Can you see my screen? Yes. I'm just gonna go ahead and place map. This is the map that we saved in our just online. I'm just gonna go ahead and add it to the map, okay? And that's already added to the map. You can go in, it's an interactive map. You can go in and you can even edit it in, um, in our just online, but we don't have a lot of time to do all of that, okay? And then I wanna go in and add, even before this, I want to go in and add a map of Dallas. Let me add a image, click on image. I'm going to click on a link. Oops, sorry. Okay. I'm going to add this. Okay. So now I've added an image of a map of Dallas, of Texas showing where Dallas is. And here I have the map of, um, that we just created in ArcGIS Online, okay? So you just wanna go in and continue adding text to your, um, to your story, okay? And if you wanna go in and add like a video, you can go back in, click on um, the plus sign, and then go in and add a video, okay? Let me go in and continue with my story. What else was here? Oh, my next paragraph was going to be on overcrowding. Okay. I want to go in and add a new a new paragraph, overcrowding. I'm gonna heading with a heading. Overcrowding. Okay. Copy and paste. But I want this to be a paragraph, a heading. Then I want to add a subheading. Let's go down. Heading. But this, I want a subheading. And I'm going to entitle it Smart Work. So for this map, I want to go in and create and add an express map, which is another type of map. But this one, it's easy. It's not. It's you can you can only save it in the story map. Okay, you cannot save it in our just online. So if you go ahead and click new express map, okay, it's just a quick easy map that you can create. You go in and type search for Texas. Okay. And then maybe I want to find, let's say Dallas, rather than just Texas, Dallas, Dallas, Texas, okay. And you can add it to a map. You can add um, arrows, you can add multiple points. These little icons here would allow you to add different points in your map. So if you click on this, you can add a point. Let's say I want to add this point here to represent Dallas, okay. And then if I want to add another city here, let's say Garland. Oops, Garland, Texas. Okay. And I'm going to add another point there to represent Dallas, Texas. Okay. And then let's say I want to draw an arrow to show um, the distance between Dallas to Texas, for example. If I go up here and add, click on the arrow, you can add, sometimes this is kind of finicky. Let's do it again. I wanna add an arrow from here to, okay. All right. And then you can add whatever annotation you want to add to your map, okay. I'm just gonna go ahead because I'm running very fast. I know we have time, we need to have time for questions. I'm gonna click on done, okay? This is not the best story that we have, but it's just showing the different kinds of things you can do. And let's say we're done with this. It's not the best story. We wanna go back and take a look, at, click on design. We want to enable navigation. Go ahead and click on navigation, okay? 
and then scroll down. Okay, close that out. You can do a preview of your map, of your story map, and see what it looks like. It's not the best map, it's not the best story, okay? And right here at the top, because we enable navigation, these links here would allow me to go to specific parts of your story rather than scrolling through to get to different parts. It would allow you to go to different parts of your story, like the section on overcrowding, okay? Rather than scrolling through the whole story that you've created. And you can also, if you go back to the top, get out of preview, go back. Okay. You can preview your story. You can decide if you want to publish the story. Let's say you, you're done with the story, with the story map. You can decide what level of sharing you want. Right now, the default is private. Okay. If you want everyone to see it, you can go ahead and check on everyone. Or if you only want people in your organization to see it, you can click on my organization and then you publish it. That's a, okay, it's published anyway. It tells me that something needs to change, but I'm gonna go ahead and publish my story. Okay. So this is just, again, I'm rushing through this whole thing because I know we need to leave time for questions. But do you have any questions there also? Let me get out of it. Any questions about what I've done so far? Any question? No? Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute and then I'm gonna go back to the um, PowerPoint slides. What is it now? Or can one of you share the slides again? I can't, let me see if I can find it. What a great job, Sylvia. I, I learned so much in that. Okay, so now, okay. So that was, I'm very sorry, it was just very rushed because there was not enough time and I know people have to leave and I know we need to leave time at the end for questions. So any questions from anyone? We don't have any in chat as of yet. Maybe people would like to ask a question. All you have to do is a mic and you can ask, or if you feel more comfortable, feel free to drop it in the chat. And there are other resources that are outlined here on the last on this last slide that you can go to that will give you more information and more resources to help you work with Adjust Online and some of the other um, and story maps as well. So, um, Michael, do you have anything else to talk about this slide? Um, well, I also just wanted to, to mention that our next TDLJS interest group meeting is coming up on June 24th at 2 p.m. If you're interested in attending, um uh please uh click on well actually let's uh maybe reshare that link again i'll go ahead and do that uh to sign up for the uh tdlgs interest group mailing list and we will be sending out information about that upcoming meeting so you can get the zoom link so that you can, i got it michael great okay faster than i am um uh, yeah so we, we'd love to see you there you know again uh you know uh this group is is very welcoming to, to anybody with uh, any um, level of GS experience. Uh, really, you know, many of us are are there to just to be able to continue learning together um, and to, to build our, our network of GS contacts at other institutions. So, um, if you if you found this workshop helpful or interesting, you'd like to learn more uh, about GIS um, and all the things that you can do with it, um, you know, please uh, consider attending. Or you can reach out to any one of us, and we'll be very we'll be more than welcome to give you some more information and help you some more. So, yeah. And um, Michael, the two links you shared with us, um, the one about Austin um, in the 60s, and then I can't remember the other one. Those are examples of story maps as well, right? Yes. So yes, just so what are... Sylvia was demonstrating how to build. Yes, yeah, yeah, so mine was like a mishmash. Those were like, I'm sorry, sorry. Those were like, um, well put together story maps. I was just trying to show the different things you could do. Yes, so yeah, so those, those are some very polished story maps uh, yeah. that those authors had, had you know spent a lot of time uh, putting together, and, and that just shows, uh, and they're very different um, too. And 
uh, in terms of the content that they contain. So I think those were good examples highlighting um, you know, what you can do with story maps and, and the directions that you can take that and format in. Anything else? I know it was kind of, I don't know how many of you had time while I was following along or it was just, just watching what we were doing, what I was doing. But um, it's a little hard to, if you have just one computer to be going back and forth, you know. I thought the pace was really good. I was able to click as you were clicking. Oh, you were? Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Okay. I feel very... Okay. And then there's comments of excellent job. So good job, everybody. Okay. So thank you, everyone. So do we know whether the people who are in here had institutional accounts or do we not? I don't know, although I did open my institutional account. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm curious uh, for any of those that, that are here that don't mind uh, you know, sharing either in chat or, or uh, unmuting. Um, yeah, I, I was wondering if folks were following along uh, using public accounts or institutional accounts or if they were just observing that in the demo. No, shy to speak. I know someone here from SMU and it, so we have an institutional account. Whether he knows it or not, I'm not sure. Any other person wants to share whether or not they have an institutional account? No? So there's a comment that says that they couldn't get it to create an account that we'll investigate later. So maybe they tried to do the public and, and couldn't get that. Time. Okay, so. I, I you have an institutional account because I know this person. I know the oh. name. <laughs> okay. I know the name, so I'm, I'm guessing it's the same person I know. You have an SMU Dallas account. So we can I can help you figure that out later on or if you have time, some other time. Any questions from the rest of the participants? Yeah. Well. Okay. UT at Rio Grande Valley, I'm thinking. Well, that's good. Okay. Thanks, Gabby. Uh, yeah. So were you able to log in using that account? Okay. I tried to log in using the account and it didn't work. So maybe I have the wrong base password, but now that I know that we have it, you know, that's something we can look into. Okay, good. Well, as we wait, if we have any questions, I don't know if we will or not, but maybe we could um, uh, advertise again the mini sprint coming up from the GIS um, um, interest group, and it will be in August. Um, and if you follow the um, listserv there that we've asked you to sign up for, then you'll get some more information or come to the June 24th meeting too, so we'll see you there. Yeah, yeah thanks for uh, bringing that up, uh, Cynthia. Yeah, I forgot to, to mention that. Um, but yeah, that'll be exciting. So uh, that's what, August 9th and 10th? That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
We're going to have a little bit of time in the morning with a quick follow-up in the afternoon, looking at Python and GIS. Lots of good stuff there. So would any of the participants want to go try using ArcGIS online, maybe? Okay, well. Celia, you demonstrated so many um, neat features in there too. And then as you start to look at these, you're like, oh, I've seen websites that look like this. So I'm sure that they've been built in Story Maps. So I was just super conscious of like, okay, I have to finish to give people time to ask questions. Like, okay. So, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You did a great job fitting everything in. Yes. Yeah. yeah you did a great Bye. job. I was going to say too, I, I was playing around in Story Maps and you can create different templates to if you want to customize the look and feel. And I don't know if that's an option in public in a public account, but if you do have an organizational account, mm -hmm. um, you can create your own template. And there's only uh, so many options that you can choose from, but that's kind of fun. Yes, it's, it's pretty simple to use, very user friendly, like Clayton just said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm pretty intuitive, you know. It's just, I haven't used the public account, so I don't really know what the limitations are. Yeah. Yeah, and yes. if you do have an organizational account, there's a lot of training that's on Esri that you can just, um, for, for free, that's included with your account. And there's a lot of free free training also that's, you don't have to have an organizational account to access, but there there is there are a lot of materials to really get, even more in depth with it. So yeah. I'll yeah. take advantage of that. Yeah. And I know a number of people, a number of classes here I are encouraging the students to use story maps for presentations. So that's a, a great way, a great so rather than PowerPoints, maybe you can try a story map for a presentation one day. So it has uses more than just beyond, you know, just um, doing something for GIS. I, I have a question. Is there a way or like, is there a repository or some sort where you can see like the things that are created by your institution? Yes. Um, if you go, well, I guess, if you go into your school, so can't, no, let me see if I can go back into, let me see. For yeah. example, if I, let me share my screen. I don't know, if, can I share my screen? You yeah, should you be able to. to. Let's see. Okay. Share. Mm -hmm. Can you see SMU? Okay. If you go, okay. If you go to organization, is that the other one? Oops. But this would only be if you are in the account. There's not like a public facing. Oh, no. I've, I don't think so. Is there? I don't think you. I don't there think is you. a public facing search. Um, But I don't know if it's possible to restrict to just materials that are available from a certain organization. Because like for now, I'm in my account. If I click on my organization, I should be able to see all, but you have to be signed in. What you're asking okay. for the public facing search thing, yeah. So these would be, like the story maps that all the people at SMU have created. Interesting. Thank you for sharing. Yes, so let me stop sharing. Yeah. If I wanted to show my content, what I have created, I would just go to my content and show what I've done. Okay. So, but yeah. But I don't, Michael. What what um public facing? Oh, I, I just shared the link to the uh, public uh, Arch, ArcGIS online um, search interface. So there, if you type in a term, like let's say you you, you, you want to find story maps about a particular topic, um, you could oh, go there okay. and type in your search term. Um, so, you know, Texas, if you want to see story maps about Texas, you type in Texas. 
and then you can restrict to the type of um, uh, content that you're looking for. So you can uh, then under the, the faceting menu on the left hand side, you'd say I only want to see story maps or I only want to see uh, web apps that yeah. are um, about Texas. So you don't have to have an account to do this? No, yeah, you don't have to have an account. Okay. Signed in. Um, so these are the things that are shared publicly. Okay. Well, we've come to 4.30. And so I just wanted to say again, thank you to our speakers. Y'all did a fantastic job. We learned some valuable skills from you, Sylvia, today. And I hope everybody joins us in our next meeting at our GIS interest group. Thank you. Thank yep, you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.